Today being Mother's Day, I thought it would be an appropriate day to a little bit about family, which is something I've been wanting to do for some time anyway. And it, I mean, our, it's going to be very tangential to our reading, except for the fact that Martha and Mary were sisters, so I'm going to sort of build it on that fact. <laughs> oh, you know, families are uh, a great blessing and a great curse. Master... Um, said, Master said, and he's not the only one who said it, you know, that God gives us our families, but thank God we can choose our friends. And that's not a particularly nice thing to say on Mother's Day, because every mother hopes that her family is going to be the exception to that. Whatever, um, what happened to us in the past, what we might not have liked about our own families, once we start with marriage or adopting or giving birth to children, we have the thought in our mind, you know, that it's going to be something entirely different that this one is going to be perfect. We hold this little dream. Many um, young, very young girls especially, you know, want to have a baby so that they'll have somebody who loves them, something that's their own. And of course the hard reality of what that really turns out to be um, comes later. It's very, very difficult because Divine Mother herself plants in our heart this um, longing for perfect love. And this longing to expand beyond our little ego into a greater reality. And then uh, Divine Mother also plants right within us this ability to reproduce at a very young, from a very early age. And this almost overwhelming desire to do so. Um, it's sort of described as being the cause of the species wanting to go on with itself. And in fact, <laughs> somebody gave me an article um, about forgiveness. And it was, uh, it was a pleasant article in the sense that at least people are thinking like this. It was an attempt to, you know, to give scientific basis without any divine input, without any higher purpose, for qualities that can only be explained through higher purpose and divine consciousness. I mean, the necessity to forgive is the realization that there is only one reality and that if I hold myself back from any aspect of creation, I'm holding myself back to that extent from God. But this um, social scientist, or whoever he was, did a study, and he decided that it was better to forgive, among other reasons, because if someone is ostracized from the tribe, then the tribe is de deprived of the genetic material that that person would give, and therefore, that's why we have an inclination to forgive, because we understand that we need everybody's genetic material to survive. I mean, how far can you torture something that is just common sense? The reason people forgive is because it hurts your heart to hate. That's why you want to forgive, because you're the one who's miserable. So God gives us uh, relationships. He gives us... Um, relationships that are absolutely defined by everything that we think we are, which is to say our physical body. We're in a physical body, and we have all these relationships that are intimately connected to that. We have the people who created the body in the first place. We have the bodies that we then created afterwards. We have the siblings who were created by the same system to get their bodies. And all of it, from birth to death in a human, in a human life, is inescapable. I mean, we add in marriage, which then just sort of has its com compelling element. Um, you know, we're, we're mated there, and then we produce others. And so it sort of gets us all embroiled, and it gets to be very hard to walk away from. In fact, most people feel that they just can't walk away from it. And on what, sometimes that is a great joy. Those are the people that will always love me. That's the place where the door will always be open. Those are the ones that no matter what I do, they will stand by me. I mean, glorious qualities. And then they're also the people that you can't get away from, even if you want to, because they're yours. And what that forces us to do is to overcome all of our little likes and dislikes, all of our little aversions, all of our, you don't please me anymore. And we are forced, often against our will, to expand our hearts. And then we discover in that necessity of having to expand our hearts, of having to be more than we thought we could be, we discover who we really are. And in that loving, in that generosity, in that self-transcendence is where our true happiness comes. 
So it's a peculiar sort of thing in the context of self-realization because on the other hand, when you think about it, if you start talking about self-realization, you know, we have many, many bodies, many, many families, many, many parents. I mean, beyond count, we have parents. And sometimes when parents are come to me and are a little distressed about the way their child is behaving and are a little bit too inclined to feel I've done something wrong, I have to do something. Sometimes I draw this little chart. I mean, this is all based, of course, on reincarnation. But the, the concept of how many lives the soul has lived up until this point, how many more lives it's going to have to live, you know, drawing a very long arc of that picture of where we've come from and where we're going, and then find a little tiny spot on that arc in which we have this incarnation, and then within that incarnation, we find a little tinier place where we have the influence of our parents. And we can see that it's not nothing, but let's not kid ourselves, really. You know, your, your babies are not born um, just a blank slate to be filled in by you. You know, they, they arrive with their full destiny. And we all know that. Yes, we're influenced. And yes, we have an enormous karmic responsibility. And that's how the whole thing begins to play itself out, you see. Because what we have in our close relationships is we have this opportunity to test our capacity to be selfless in our loving. And that's really the whole thing. That's what all life is about. Because what we're trying to do is we are trying to become infinite. We're, we're trying to become one with God. We are trying to become perfect, even as your Father in Heaven is perfect. Last week, our... A Bible reading was, everyone loves their friends. Everyone loves those who love them. But what you have to do is you have to love those who despitefully use you, who call themselves your enemies. And it's not just so you can have their genetic material in the tribe, really. Because shortly after that, that's when Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Because that is who we are. And more than that, until we raise our consciousness and find our rest in our infinite selves, we will always be unhappy. We'll always be unhappy day to day, and we will always also be unhappy in the greater scheme of things, because things will happen that are beyond our control. And as long as our sense of well-being and happiness is dependent in any way on making this world conform to us, then we will suffer. And it's not like we'll be damned to hell, and it's not like some God will be unhappy with us or anything like that. It's really a very simple problem. We hurt. That's all. We hurt. You don't need God to punish you. We punish ourselves. I mean, all of us, are we perfectly happy? Or has something happened to you yesterday or the day before or this morning? that demonstrated that we still have a ways to go in, in being that divine self. So families are our first teachers, and sometimes you have to realize the lesson of close relationships, familial or otherwise, is not always that, oh, I become a doormat and I just agree with everyone. You have to really understand that divine, unconditional love is not a wimp. You know, think about Jesus. He's a great example because we have the story of his life. The most dynamic aspect of that story, and one of the, in this, in this context, is when he went to the temple in Jerusalem and found that they had made the house of the Lord a marketplace. And they were buying and selling. And Jesus was so outraged at this, what he perceived to be a desecration of this holy place that he literally picked up a whip and drove the merchants out of the temple. Now, they were strong, and they were very well established in their position. So it wasn't just a question of him wandering through and saying, oh, gee, maybe this isn't something. Yeah. Have you all thought about completely changing your business and just doing something else? You know, and if they said no, he said, oh, okay, do what you think. He picked up a whip. He drove them out. He created a complete, total change. But he wasn't angry in the sense of closing his heart. It was just the opposite. You are not acting in accordance with the divine reality, and I will demonstrate to you what that reality is, and you will rise to it. 
And of course, he wouldn't have acted in such a way if he didn't feel moved by God to do so. And sometimes the most loving thing we do to people is to stand up straight and say, don't you ever treat me like that again. And then turn around and walk out and never come back. Sometimes that's the way to love ourselves and to love them. It's, we are, our loyalty is not to human personality. And our loyalty is not to sentiment. Our loyalty is to truth. But truth and fact are not always the same. So just because someone is limited in their ability to behave properly, it doesn't mean that it's our job to always be telling them. We have to be acting not according to our likes and dislikes, but according to our inner attunement with God. And believe me, that doesn't come just casually. That doesn't come just, oh, I think I'll just do what I want and call it God's will. You know, there's a very powerful correction taking place on our planet at this time. This is what all the masters tell us. This is what Paramahansa Yogananda has said very emphatically. He said this world has become, he, he declared this in the, in the early 50s and made it seem as if it was coming immediately, but the, the consequences seem to have been delayed, but it appears as though those consequences are beginning to catch up with us because this world has turned away from God. This world has turned to money, to material things, to, to loving each other, to sex, to self-indulgence. I mean, I can go on and on and on, and I'm not talking to you because you're sitting here obviously means that you have a, a higher inclination. I'm talking about the basis for our whole culture, and we incarnate in this world with our own personal karma. That's a fact. We're here to, to follow this unique thread of divine destiny that we've been following for many incarnations and will follow until we're God realized. But our individual karma also takes place in the context and in the background of uh, national, international, planetary karma. We choose to associate ourselves with a particular reality. And it's all happening in perfect harmony, even if we don't like it, even if it doesn't please us. Nonetheless, we're here because this is what this is the set of circumstances we needed to live through. So we're all part of it. And there's those who are actively creating dissonance and those who are actively working to try to create harmony. And the two forces are working against each other at this time. And Yogananda tells us that it, it won't be a smooth transition, that those forces will create quite a destructive energy he spoke of, of weather patterns and natural cataclysms. And Yogananda said very strongly, he said, more than, more than most people realize, he said, the vibrations of human thought create the magnetism of the planet. And that magnetism determines everything. Of course, economic conditions, uh, political conditions, wars, famines, crop failures, rain, lack of rain, hurricanes, earthquakes. It's all a magnetic force and all of these thought forms are working together and there's a lot of dissonance. I mean, just look around. And the dissonance is not just power over power, but it's people's inner commitment. You know, who am I? Where does my happiness come from? How do I live in this world? What is my destiny? And we're in a very um, fascinating transition, really. And what the masters declare is it's not enough for a few good people to say, oh, we want the world to be nicer. He said, what we have to do is we have to turn our consciousness to the infinite. We have to turn our consciousness to God. Now, I was, I was trying to explain this last night in a, a different group, and the thought came to me, which I've never quite been able to say, because people often say, well, why do we need God? It's just our positive thoughts. We just have to be positive, and people will even say, you know, don't talk about bad things. That creates negative vibrations. And it's a little hard to grasp all of that. But what we're dealing with is when we are in right relationship to the infinite, you see, we are fully aware at all times that we are moving in the, in the, um, under the protection and under the guidance of infinitely wise forces, loving forces. This is why Paramahansa Yogananda spoke of God as Divine Mother. You know, Jesus 
If the Jews had God as the judge, he was the fair judge, he laid down the commandments, we do what he says, and if we follow the law, that's what Judaism was built on, the law, if we follow the law, then we are in harmony with the divine and everything will work out. And it's a valid teaching, it's a, a way to look at it. And at the time that Moses was born, as an avatar, which he was, to those people, they were, uh, uh, had been a slave people and they had to be brought into some form. And the right teaching for them was God, as a, as a righteous judge, here is the law, follow the law. So we got the Ten Commandments that we had to follow. Jesus came, and by that time, the concept of God as, as judge had been corrupted. And the law had become an instrument of oppression, not of freedom. That's why he even, he said the phrase, the Sabbath was made to serve man. Man wasn't born to obey the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created to help men understand how to focus their consciousness in a divine way. But the Sabbath had become an instrument of oppression in the hands of the priests. So Jesus said, God is our father. If you ask of your father a loaf of bread, will he hand you a stone? Because the judge of the Jews had become so hard-hearted, especially interpreted by the priests who wanted the power. And so there was no warmth. So Jesus said, he's our father. He's our common father, our father who art in heaven. I am the son. We are all children to try to bring them to a, an understanding of greater love, but that was as far as he could take it. Then Yogananda comes in recent times, and he speaks of God as the Divine Mother. And this is not about men and women. This is not about sexism or gender or anything. This is about now what we are ready for, what, what the world, the planet is ready for, the background of our individual karma is this intimate relationship of love with God. And this is where we started, isn't it? This was the thought. This is Mother's Day. What are we celebrating when we celebrate Mother? We're celebrating that image of perfect, perfect selfless love, not self-abnegating, not um, self-sacrificing um, in the wrong way, but that perfect image of, I care about you so deeply, <clears throat> that I will devote my life to making yours beautiful. And also what mother means to us is the place where we can go, the place where we can just curl up. And even with the father, much as he loves us, the father is more impersonal. You know, of course I love you, son, but this is what you need to do. The mother just says, oh, come, rest in my arms, rest in my lap, and oh, how the heart longs for that. Isn't that what everyone is seeking? That's why we find husbands and wives and make children and everything that we do. What are we looking for? We're looking for a place of comfort and of rest. And what the masters say to us is, Divine Mother. What Master says to us, Divine Mother, she's always with us. Now, if Divine Mother is with us, and if this world, in fact, is under the care of a loving mother, now, isn't it so even Children, have you ever disagreed with your mother? Especially when you were a child? Especially, you know, when she wanted you to do things that didn't exactly incur with what you thought you wanted to do? Now, sometimes mothers are wrong. And even on the spiritual path, Swamiji once gave advice to a young man. He gave very strong advice to a young man. And the man said, oh, but if I did that, my mother would be so disappointed. Swamiji said, sooner or later, you have to disappoint your mother like that, which is you can't just live for other people's realities. But we're talking about the Divine Mother who always knows best for us. So if in this world there is a Divine Mother, if any part of us knows that, and if we know that Divine Mother is in charge, then we can look around and say, that should be different, that should be different, these people should be different, they shouldn't be behaving like that, why is this happening? We need to change it. But if we say that, without stopping to think. I wonder what Divine Mother has in mind here. I wonder where this is really going. I wonder what the lesson here really is. 
So if we try to solve the problems of this world, if we try to make this world different just because I like this and I don't like that, well, I mean, some things are self-evidently not likable. I don't like that there's a genocide in this country. I don't like that there's a famine over here. I don't like that these people are polluting the planet. Of course we don't like that. I mean, why would we be happy when we see the fruits of dissonance happening everywhere? But in so far, is that opinion is based on our personal anxiety, then we are not in tune with God, you see? Because what can we be afraid of? Nobody's in charge. That's what we're really saying. Nobody's in charge. We have to be in charge. It's a horrible burden, unbearable burden, and also a false burden. We're not, the super ego is not what's making things happen here. And people are trying to just sort of be super good people. And if enough of us are super good people, then maybe somehow all those super bad people like do something else, right? But there's this terrifying feeling, isn't there? You know, one man all by himself fills a SUV full of dynamite and drives it into New York City and just parks it there. And I mean, you know, is, gets this close to getting away with it. I mean... That sort of thing can keep you up at night, right? My mother, toward the end of her life, became very nervous about everything. Literally, people sometimes do because they, you know, she lost control over everything as she got older. And I remember how nervous she was because there was some asteroid or satellite or something, something was going to come through the atmosphere and was going to boing down somewhere. And she became really convinced it was our house in Claremont, California. You know? <laughs> it was that whatever, I don't even remember, but it was very difficult the dissuader of this, but you see that's just the exaggerated geriatric fruit of a lifetime lived always thinking that it was up to me and that my well-being is always up to me. We must, and this is what the Master say, this is what Master has declared with tremendous energy, the purpose of the insecure times, and insecure is a very mild word for what he said, the purpose of the cataclysmic changes that are going to take place on this planet is one purpose. And that is to teach us, the humanity on this planet, that we are not in charge. That we live by the will of God and in harmony with that will. And our first question is not, what am I afraid of and what do I want different? Our first question is, Divine Mother, guide me. Divine Mother, be with me. Show me where this is going, and then let me help you to move it. Because sometimes, really, difficult things have to happen. If the law of karma is true, and believe me, this is a very challenging teaching. If the law of karma is ever true, it's always true. And it's very hard. It's easy to say, oh, God gave me this beautiful apartment. God gave me the parking place. God gave me the uh, whatever. But then when all of that is taken away... Did God do that, or did he just act when you liked it? Right? Is this easy? No. But this is the basis of real faith. And the power of this also is, you see, what then will you ever have to fear? You know, the masters are really not content with just us feeling good a little bit now. A bad mother doesn't, you know, spoils her children. Oh, honey, you don't like it here. Oh, you know, Daddy said you couldn't have those cookies, but I'll give them to you. Oh, that bad teacher, you don't have to go back. You know, you don't like broccoli? No broccoli for you, just cake. Yeah, <laughs> much better, right? Is that a loving mother or is that a coward? Is that someone who's choosing her own comfort over your well-being? The good news is Divine Mother will never do that. The bad news is Divine Mother will never do that. Right? So it's really a question of which side of this equation do we want to be on? You know? Who do we think is, I mean, who, <laughs> the way I say it to myself, I used to say this about Swami Kriyananda too. You know, if I weigh it in the balance, who, who do I think has a better chance of being right, me or him? You know? Like, who is more likely to be motivated by ego and self-interest and fear? Swami Kriyananda or me? Hmm. You know, <laughs> it really didn't take me very long to figure out that even if I didn't understand, chances are if I just held my 
my mind in abeyance, I would learn something. And if I just clung to what I already know, and what I already know is almost always this form, whatever, however you mask it, and we're so clever at masking it, it's usually this, I don't like it, right? Little children are so adorable, I don't like it. I don't like it. And we're much more refined. Oh, I really don't think that's right. For you know. <laughs> I really don't think I should be without a job right now. So. But Divine Mother knows what she's doing, and unless and until we turn our hearts to her. But you see, the wonderful thing about it is it's not an all or nothing. It's not like misery, 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 and then suddenly, oh, a little bit of relief. No, it's just the opposite. The more we open our heart to that divine presence, the more we begin to realize, you know, difficult as that se- this may seem, I'm not alone. And, and sometimes we have to be pushed pretty far, you know, to, to get to the edge of our own power and to, a certain, to the point where we, we're willing to cooperate with something higher. That's what Master says is going to happen to the planet. The planet's going to be pushed really hard to the point where many more people are willing to say, look, I, I don't know what's going on here. Where can we go? What can we find? What can we do? And then when we begin to do that, what happens is, you see, suddenly we discover that we were never alone. And the company that's inside us is the fulfillment of everything we were so frantically seeking. You know, it's, all, it's always been there. It's always been there. But we were very busy doing other things. But it's always been there and will always be there. You know, in the context of our life as a spiritual family, which is what I also wanted to talk about, you see, it's a very odd thing. Human families come and go. You know, you can divorce, you can get away from them. Spiritual families last forever. Because our spiritual families are united together by our shared understanding and our aspiration to help one another come to this higher level of reality. Spiritual families are extremely interesting because they're not based on egoic affinity. Spiritual families are based on shared divine aspiration. I realized that in my early years at Ananda when I first came there and I realized that one of my best friends was someone I didn't like at all. It sounds paradoxical to the ego, doesn't it? But she and I were both completely devoted to, uh, uh, to the same ideals. And that made us have more in common than I could have with many other human beings with whom I could have much nicer conversations. And she wasn't a nice person. And I was really mean to her. We had on Every level that you would look at, no relationship at all and certainly nothing admirable. And I realized that I would give my life for her. And I actually knew she would give her life for me. Because everything else was superficial compared to our shared commitment to realize God and to help one another to do so. You know, in the context of Ananda, we invite you to be part of this spiritual family because the power of unifying our energies and standing next to one another and mirroring back to one another this divine truth, whether we mirror it back clearly or muddled, there, there comes to be a certain power, especially in this time. You know what, what the path of self-realization, there is not a self-realization church on every corner. And self-realization is not something that you can just sort of everybody understands. Turning toward God is, you know, it's getting there. But it's not a really big story. And those who, who share ideals with you and will be true with you to the ideals that you have also embraced, you know, such people are worth more than gold. When Yogananda was a boy or a young man and he had found his guru, Sri Yukteswar, his father was a deep devotee of the same path. But out of jealousy or misunderstanding, at some point, his father said something critical of Sri Yukteswar, Yogananda's guru. Just some critical, he, report, he repeated a rumor or something. You know, these things happen, even among great souls. Yogananda turned to his father and he said, human birth is something. 
I'm grateful because you were the instrument through which this human body came to me, Yogananda says. Human birth is something, but divine birth is everything. And he looked at his father, he said, you say one more word against my guru and I will disown you forever. I mean, just no contest. And his father, of course, said, no, I'm sorry, and never said another word, just like that. Now, God knows we don't want to come to this point. I asked Swamiji once in my own life, what do I owe my parents? And he said, have they ever tried to draw you away from the spiritual path? He said, I said, no, never. He said, then you should always be very kind and respectful. But if they ever ask you to choose, I said, no contest, sir. He said, no contest. Human birth is something, divine birth is everything. So we are born into our human families, which give us our body. We create other families through our love and our actions and our biological capacity to create children, and we give our lives to them. And that's something, because everywhere we have to practice. The little fits into the greater. But your guru bhais, your spiritual brothers and sisters, who have been with you for ages and will be with you forever and understand who you are and where you are going. That is the true family. If you can manage to bring your, your birth family into that, that's a great blessing. But even if they disown you, physical birth is something, divine birth is everything. And that's not a really very popular Mother's Day sermon, is it? <laughs> Wow, how did we get there? I want it to be a lot nicer. <laughs> okay, well, I guess there's not too much to do except say God bless you. <laughs>